The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Okay, our uh, next speaker is Andy Naranjo. Uh, he's, uh, he's currently the, the cement lab supervisor for the Texas Department of Transportation Construction Division. Uh, he conducts the in-house research and oversees the material research program. He's involved with the ASI research since the early 2000s and has conducted numerous laboratory and field investigation. Welcome, Andy. Uh, for those of you who aren't from Texas, there's a saying, everything's bigger in Texas. Uh, our cracks in concrete, and therefore our crack gauges. So uh, we always scale up. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, some work we've been doing for the past uh, year or so on a modification to uh, basically the 1293 uh, concrete prism test. Going to cover the current methods, basically 126 and 1293, because that's kind of what we use in our in our lab, um, then talk about some of the modifications we've done to uh, to the prism test to see if we could improve on it. Then some results on the prism test versus what I'm calling the concrete cylinder test, and then a little bit about accelerating both of those test methods. Some ongoing work, and that should wrap it up. All right. So for the current test methods, uh, we really rely on mainly 1567. We don't do much with 1260. We do a lot of 1260 testing, but we don't really do anything with that data. Our specifications are mainly geared around 1567. Pros of it, it's relatively rapid. You know, 16 days plus whatever agri-processing time uh, is required. Uh, however, cons, very aggressive. Uh, one normal soak solution at a very high temperature. Can't be used to... Uh, uh, look at the influence of alkalinity from your materials. And then we have this issue of these false positives at, uh, from coarse aggregates. Uh, we have uh, work that we're funding at UT Austin right now that is trying to identify a lot of these uh, coarse aggregates that will pass 1260, but then when you run 1293, uh, they tend to fail. And so initially we thought we only had a handful, three or four in the state, I think now we're up to 15 or 16. Um, so uh, little by little, we're, we're coming across to you. And that's an issue because if they pass 1260, you can't really use 1567 to determine how much fly ash you're going to need in a mixture. So it's kind of a, it, it, it hurts us a little bit. Uh, then we get into 1293, which is the concrete prism test. And the one, as Tori mentioned, is our reference condition or the most reliable test method. A little more realistic conditions as far as uh, uh, compared to 1260. Uh, alkali loading is about, you raise to one and a quarter. Uh, but there's some cons to it. Takes a year. No one's going to wait around for a year tests, especially if you're trying to get something through a project. Even worse, if you're looking at SEM mixes, that's two years. And then a little more into the testing aspect is this leaching of alkali during the test. Um, that seems to be a big issue. If you go through literature, that always comes up as one of the issues with the test. And then some more recent issues are these non-reactive aggregate issues. Are they really non-reactive, I guess? And then issues with when you start to try to accelerate that version of the test. I'm going to talk just briefly about this leaching of alkalis. So a bunch of studies have been done that look at how much alkali is leaching now. They've checked the, the water, alkali content of the water in the bottom of the bucket that your prisms are stored in over the test, and there's always an increase. But I was curious what that, what, what that effect translates to expansion. I did this uh, 
real quick study uh, where I took a three by six cylinder uh, mortar uh, with a reactive aggregate and made it up where one does not leach and the other one is typically in the 1293 condition. And so early on, they kind of tracked similarly, but then it tailed off and stopped expanding on the one that was allowed to leach. Uh, but the other one kept going, and I stopped the test, but I, eventually it, it, it would have leveled off at some point. And so all things being equal except the keeping the alkalis in the, 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 the specimen, I mean, that's a significant difference in expansion. Now, it's a little exaggerated, smaller specimen size, um, probably some, a uh, little more leaching going on than you would think a, a three by three prism would do, but I just, it just, uh, shows the influence of that leaching on expansion. So if you were to take this to 1293, knowing that that, uh, leaches as well, what effect does that do to your expansion? And where it really concerns us is these aggregates that just barely pass or just barely fell 1293. Are they being influenced by this uh, leaching of alkalis uh, throughout the test? All right, so we kind of sat around and thought of ways of what we could do to uh, figure this out, make, made some simple modifications. So first couple things, we need some goals. Well, we want to shorten the duration of tests. No one's going to use a year-long test. So if we could get it down to six months, that's a little easier to swallow. Three months is even better, but, you know, we're trying to... Uh, speed it up a little. Uh, the other big thing was minimizing leaching or actually preventing leaching of alkalis so that way we know we have the full potential of that aggregate uh, and those alkalis. And then I guess the holy grail is can we get a job approval test method where you could take a job mix uh, materials and actually test it in, in those proportions so no boosting in alkalis or anything like that. So we did several different things. We changed the specimen type, so we went from uh, from we changed from prisms to something else. How we store the, the specimens, and then the, one of the issues was providing adequate moisture uh, with so that way we could still have the reaction, but we don't prevent we we prevent leaching. So that was kind of the big the big issue. All right, so specimen type, we went from the traditional three by three prism. Uh, to what everyone knows, four by eight cylinder. So that was the first change. Um, and you'll see the reasons why. Specimen storage, this is typically what you do in 1293. You make your prisms, uh, you demold them, and then they go into a five gallon bucket, uh, on a platform, stored above water, and then that bucket goes into whatever environment oven you, uh, you're gonna put them in. We just kept them in the cylinder mold. Uh, so that way we completely got rid of the bucket and that is now our storage environment in that. So now we'll just put that cylinder mold in uh, whatever environment chamber we have. So one of the problems you have is uh, you can't, it's difficult to cast the studs into the prism mold. Uh, so fortunately we have this uh, machinist lathe that's probably 50 years older than I am but it still works, and so we take it and we drill our gauge studs, poxy them in, and then because we don't really know how good we got our gauge length depths, we actually measure pin to pin to figure out what our gauge length is, uh, and then we get it set up for the uh, comparator reading. So that's kind of us, our, our process to get our specimen ready. All right, and then we either put them in an environmental chamber or environmental room, whichever temperature we're, we're particularly looking at. Uh, we are running some 1293s at the same time, so these are our cylinders store in, in their stored condition as, as, as in our lab. All right, so the problem we had, well, again, was the moisture issue. So you're keeping it in this mold, so how do you allow moisture to get to the specimen uh, so that way you could drive the reaction? And so we came up with two things. The first one, um, we lined that mold with two layers of filter paper. Uh, and the idea behind that is to allow water to wick down the sides of that mold so that way we make sure the entire mold is is kept damp. Uh, the other uh, solution was we cast the cylinder about a quarter inch short so that way we're able to pond water on top of this surface and then we place the cap back on it and 
you know, we don't have any moisture loss uh, through evaporation and stuff like that. The seal doesn't make a really good seal, especially when you're at the higher temperatures. Um, so it's kind of tedious. We have, I have a lab tech that comes in every couple of times a week, pops all the caps off and fills them up with water again. Uh, but the filter paper always stays wet. Even if the water is, leaves the cylinder, that filter paper is all, always wet. So we kind of know we have that cylinder moist all the time. All right, so this is some preliminary results that we've gotten thus far. Um, this is some 1293 data that UT, uh, I got from University of Texas. Um, we kind of did some of the same aggregates they had already had data on, so uh, I asked we could use that. And this is one of the aggregates we're talking about. It just barely passed or fails 1293. Um, and this is another course aggregate that uh, a little higher expansion. So this is, this is typical uh, 1293. So when you look at the concrete cylinder test, um, this aggregate is the same aggregate as that one. Uh, so we see a, a drastic difference in expansion uh, just from keeping all those alkalis in that in that specimen. Uh, this is again the same one, um, almost at about the same expansion in about 20 weeks. So you know that, that's just from the leaching of alkali. That's a that's a huge difference in in, in results. Um, so if you go back to our goals, shorting the length of time to test. So if we're just comparing. When do we get 12, the same 1293 value? I mean, we could cut it down to about 20 weeks or so, right? Um, but again, the issue now is, is that 1293 year data point the right data point to be gauging off of? We got a lot of other ones going, and but this is just some of the early data we've gotten. But it was quite surprising to see how the significant difference in, in the expansion there. When we go to accelerate the concrete prism test, um, funny things happen. Uh, we get high early expansions, and then it starts to flatten out, and then our expansion rate kind of drops significantly. Through literature, this is due to the leaching of alkalis, and then at the higher temperatures of 140, pore solution starts to change, different things start coming out into solution, and then so your, your pore chemistry changes. So that affects your expansion rate. So at the one year mark, we have a significant difference in expansion. So now we'll look at the concrete cylinder test that's accelerated. Uh, again, these are uh, 100 and 100 degrees, so similar to the concrete prism test. Accelerated, uh, rapid uh, expansion, and then slowly tails off, and then flat lines about the 13 week mark on, on that particular fine aggregate. Uh, this aggregate still had some expansion past it, but Surprisingly, I was shocked that they were about the same expansion at one year. Whatever's magical about one year, it's beyond me, but uh, it, it it worked. So uh, when we were seeing this trend that we weren't going to see this crossover um, early on, we did a whole other bunch of aggregates to see if uh, maybe these were flukes. Um, but everything else it seems to be showing the same trend. Um, hotter temperature... Lower temperature, hotter temperature, lower temperature. And then our non-reactive co combination of aggregates hasn't done anything. So uh, we feel fairly confident that uh, we may be on to something here. Um, what it means, I think, is still too early to, to make any leaping conclusions, but I think there are some improvements that uh, we can do to 1293. All right, some ongoing work. Uh, again, so we're still going to continue the concrete cylinder test versus the concrete prism test. Again, any lab test, if you don't have a way to leak the field, it's uh, worthless. So we have, again, our, our own exposure site that that's, uh, we've kicked off, uh, making smaller blocks and trying to link them to uh, our cylinders. Uh, the issue of this uh, non-reactive aggregate. So this is 1260 data for every fine aggregate in Texas. And you see one of the issues we have, we have over 157 fine aggregates just in Texas alone. Trying to test all those was a, was a chore. And we have very few of these non-reactive. I think we only had, currently I think there's 12. Some have been, are not producing anymore. Are these actually non-reactive and which one should be used for the test? We're actually using this very first one down here as our non-reactive one so far. So we're going to be doing some work with these other sets right here to see uh, if they'll pass 1293 as well. 
And the last one is looking at fly ash mixtures. Uh, again, the 1293 test is a two-year test. If you look at our initial fly ash mixtures, this is 45% replacement. Uh, we have a 29% CAO ash at 100, at a 140 and 100, and then a 22% CAO ash at a, at the same temperatures. So, uh, big difference. And we've already flatlined, or pretty much flatlined on the hotter temperature, and it looks like we just barely started. Uh, we're coming up on a year on these, and we've just started to kind of ramp up that expansion. But then the significance of the fly ash, uh, high CAO versus low CAO uh, on these sea ashes. So uh, that's some interesting stuff. We got a bunch of, of ash mixtures uh, cooking still, and so it's going to be some interesting data. Like the University of Texas, we work real close with them on some of this stuff, and they do some great work. Our concrete te technicians and our cement lab technicians, they do all the work. I'm just up here telling them what they do, so thank you.